start today's session uh just just wait for one minute Uh, good morning to all. I welcome all of you to this online science camp organized by Breakthrough Science Society Trivandrum chapter. Now I would request uh, Mr. Jodis Babu to conduct this session. Over to you, Jodis Babu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. Uh, today's topic is knowing your ex expanding universe. And it is uh, your speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Anand Narayanan. He is currently working as a professor in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences, Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, Tiruvandavaram. And uh, Dr. Anaran did his PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from Pennsylvania State University, USA. He is an active researcher in the field of astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, presently, his research is on understanding the physical condition in the intergalactic medium and gal galaxy halos. He is also actively involved in popularization of science. He writes science articles in newspapers regularly, especially in the Hindu newspaper. Recently, he produced a documentary on 180 years of old uh, Travancore Observatory titled Hidden in the Mist of Time. Dr. Anand Narayan is closely associated with Breakthrough Science Society in the popularization of science. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I think we can move on to our today's session. I invite uh, Dr. Anand Narayanan. Thank you. Thank you, Jodis, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to reach out to all of you, so many of you, on Zoom and also on YouTube uh, as part of uh, Breakthrough Science Society's this online science camp that is going on for, uh, well, today is the first day, but it will go on for many days. So it's a, it's a great honor for me to be able to associate with Breakthrough Science Society. Um, I will start my presentation by sharing the slides. Just give me one second. Someone can just let me know whether the screen is visible, the PowerPoint presentation. Yes, sir, it is visible. Yeah, okay, thank you. So uh, as uh, the person who introduced Ajodhi sir mentioned, uh, the title for today's presentation is um, Know Your Expanding Universe. So what we are going to discuss is the story behind the observational evidence for one of science's greatest discoveries. And that is the discovery that the universe that we are living in is not static, but it's expanding. It's, it's growing in its size. And so <laughs> this is a concept that uh, probably many of you will be knowing, uh, especially if you have been reading astronomy, if you have been watching astronomy documentaries on television, uh, if you have been uh, reading popular science books on astronomy, then this fact that we are living in an expanding universe, this might be very well uh, uh, known to you. So we will be, what we will be doing in today's presentation is we will be taking a very close look at this extremely important discovery in, in, in the history of cosmology. And we will try to understand it in a certain level of detail. Because many, uh, uh, many have uh, doubts about what it means when we say that we are living in an expanding universe. So when we say that we are living in an expanding universe, what is it that is really expanding? The space between you and me, the space between uh, your school and where you are, your house, okay, that is not expanding. Um, the space between planets of the solar system is not expanding. Uh, the distance, the separation between stars within our galaxy is not really changing much. So how do we then say that we are living in an expanding universe? So we will look up, we will look at all these concepts. And uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, one of the uh, most brilliant discoveries that have happened in the field of science in the last century. So uh, let's begin by doing a very quick 30 second uh, 
overview of the history of our universe many of you are probably aware of the idea that our universe had a beginning okay the big bang theory is the leading explanation about how the universe began the universe started out so the, what you are looking at in this slide is a schematic representation of the origin of the universe and its subsequent evolution so from an early universe which was infinitely hot and infinitely dense the universe has been cooling and evolving and growing in size for the past 14 billion years so if you look at this diagram at the bottom it's written 13.77 billion years so just to remind you a billion is one followed by nine zeros so that's how old our universe is so we can approximate it as 14 billion years so the early universe was infinitely hot infinitely dense we don't know through science Uh, it's difficult to answer this question of what was the exact moment of origin like okay what was the exact moment of creation like we we don't know what happened before big bang etc because from the framework of physics from the framework of science we cannot address those questions but what we know is what has happened to the universe since its origin and the most important thing is that the universe did have an origin at least there are multiple lines of evidences that suggest that our universe had an origin okay and this idea that there was a big bang there was a there is an origin for the universe this idea rests on three pillars there are three pillars that support this idea that our universe had a beginning or there was a big bang okay now the ultimate triumph of any idea any scientific idea is when it makes a prediction about something and which later gets confirmed by experiments or observations okay so that's the ultimate test of any theory okay or any hypothesis hypothesis means educated guess okay so uh, that's what uh, makes uh, something very successful in uh, as a scientific idea that it makes a prediction and later it is confirmed by experiment or observation so big bang theory made a couple of predictions the mathematical models of uh, big bang theory made a couple of predictions all of which have been found to be true so these uh, i'm going to list three of the most important uh, pieces of evidences in support of the big bang model one is that big bang predicted that our early universe was very hot and very dense so when i say hot the early universe had temperatures that are greater than the temperature in the core of stars so star in, in the core of stars the temperatures are typically of the order of 10 million to 100 million kelvin the uh, very early universe had temperatures much greater than that and since then the universe has been expanding has been growing in size and as a result the temperature of the universe has been dropping has been declining so big bang predicted that if the universe had a beginning and if that early state was indeed very dense and hot then today we should see the electromagnetic radiation the light the photons left over from that those early epochs of our universe today we should see it in all directions in our universe and this was later on confirmed by observations the second idea is that the relative abundance of big bang theory the theoretical framework of big bang predicted how much of hydrogen deuterium helium lithium these are the light elements in the periodic table that many of you must have studied so big bang theory predicted what should be the abundance what should be the amount of these light elements that should be present in the universe and later on through observations astronomers confirmed the predictions to be true and last but not least perhaps the most important among them is the idea that uh, big bang predicted that the universe should be expanding and this was also observationally verified so we are not going to look at the first two points in today's uh, presentation we will uh, be focusing exclusively on the third point which is the expansion of the universe so that's what this presentation is about now to talk about the history of the uh, expansion of the universe or when astronomers discovered that the universe is expanding we have to roll back time and we have to go back to the beginning of the 20th century that is early 1900s okay so here is a picture of a very famous uh, astronomer okay his name is edwin hubble uh, edwin hubble was a astronomer uh, Uh, in the us and hubble in the early 1900s made uh, many important discoveries that forever changed our understanding of the universe 
one of those discoveries was the expansion of the universe. So in this picture, you see Edwin Hubble looking through the 48 inch telescope at the Palomar Observatory, which is a Palomar mountaintop observatory in a place called California in the US. Uh, so uh, that's the picture of Edmund Hubble. And this observation that we are living in an expanding universe, this was made by Edwin Hubble and his some, uh, companion or, or and his friend, Milton Humanson. So you see both of them in the picture here. On the left is Edwin Hubble, uh, who lived from 1889 to 1953. And on the right is Milton Humanson. Okay. Uh, so there, if you, you, I would encourage you to go and read about both Edwin Hubble and Milton Hansen. If you Google their names, it will you can read about them. Edwin Hubble actually started his professional life as a lawyer. He was not an astronomer, but then he, after uh, practicing law for some years, he went back to college, to university, again to get a PhD in astronomy. Edwin Hubble served as a soldier in World War One. And by the time World War II happened in the 1940s, Hubble was too old to serve as a soldier. So he worked on other military projects, etc. As most of you know, the early part of the 20th century was a very tumultuous time in the history of the, uh, in the history of the world. So anyway, uh, here is Edwin Hubble and Milton Humanson. And here in the center, we see a telescope that Hubble and Humanson had used to make this important discovery that we are living in an expanding universe. This is the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope. So in the next slide, I'm going to show you a small video of the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope. Just a few seconds now. The very old observatory, more than a hundred year old, about 120 or more number of year old observatory. This is Mount Wilson is again in California. It's situated about uh, the, the it's situated on a mountain top about 1,500 meters above the sea level. So this is the telescope that Hubble and Humanson used to make that important discovery. So I'll tell you what that discovery is or what their observations were. So what you're looking at here is a picture of galaxies. There are multiple galaxies in this image. So every bright object that you're seeing here in this picture, if you can see my mouse pointer, wherever I'm pointing with my mouse pointer, each one of them is a galaxy similar to the Milky Way galaxy with billions of stars in it. Our Milky Way has about 200 billion stars. So each one of these galaxies are probably bigger or sometimes smaller than the Milky Way. Each one of them is a distinct galaxy. Now what Hubble and Humanson did is, using the 100-inch Mount Wilson telescope, they looked at several galaxies in the local universe, in the nearby universe, and they recorded, they collected, using the telescope, they collected light from those galaxies and took a spectrum of those galaxies. Okay. Now, what is a spectrum? Now, I'm sure many of you have done this experiment in school where you take a uh, white light okay. and uh, just a second. Yeah, where you uh, take white light and you pass it through a prism and the light that emerges from that will have the light spread into its different colors. So this rainbow-like colors that we see when white light passes through a prism, this is called the spectrum of this white light. So what this prism is doing is it is splitting the white light into different energies. The white light is actually a composite of many different, uh, light of many different colors, light of many different energies, okay? light of many different wavelengths. These are all terms that we use in physics. So once it passes through the prism, the light gets dispersed. The, all the colors are split out and then we begin to see the rainbow of colors. So Hubble and Humanson took the light, collected the light from these many galaxies in the local universe and they split the light into its component wavelengths, into its component colors. That's what they did. Now, what were they trying to do with that? Well, to understand that, we need to understand the Doppler effect of light. Now, I don't know whether if this is taught at class 10 or uh, class 9, but uh, I'll explain to you what the Doppler effect of light is. If it has not been taught to you, I'm sure you will learn it in higher secondary. So if you have a source that is emitting light, let's say a bulb or, or a star, 
and if that source is at rest relative to us then we will not see any change in the light that we get from that source but if that source is moving away from us as shown in the top diagram then if you record a spectrum of that source we collect the light from it and split it into its different colors we will see that the spectrum is shifting towards red part of the color grid okay in more physics terms we say that the light uh, the wavelength of the light is getting red shifted which means the light's energy is getting shifted from lower to higher energies so this is called red shift so when the source that is emitting light is moving away from us we see that the wavelength of light gets is increased okay the wavelength of the light that we are getting from that source is increased and that's what we refer to as a red shift and if that same source that's emitting light is moving towards us then the light will shift towards higher energies shorter wavelengths and we call that a blue shift so this shift in light coming from a source helps us to identify whether that source is moving away from us or is it coming towards us if the source is at rest if it is stationary relative to us meaning that the separation between us and that source if it's not changing with time then we will not see a blue shift or red shift okay so let's look at this in a little bit more detail so here is let's say this is the spectrum of a galaxy so we see the rainbow like colors going from violet all the way to red okay so somebody has taken a telescope collected the light from a galaxy and they have sent it through a prism and the prism is splitting light into different energies and we see a spectrum like this so in addition to the colors we also see some lines in it okay dark lines we dark lines are called absorption lines and they are produced by atoms and ions that are present in that galaxy okay so here we are look take here taken an example of a galaxy so these dark and uh, these dark lines they are produced by atoms and ions in that galaxy now if, if that galaxy is not moving relative to us then the lines all these lines and colors will be at a specific location in wavelength space okay so if you look at the light in terms of its wavelength all these lines and colors will be at the wavelengths where they are supposed to be but if that galaxy is moving away from us as we record the light then depending on how fast the galaxy is moving away we will see that the entire spectrum is shifting towards higher wavelength okay which is towards red so you can see that this dark line you take any dark line here you can see that in the second picture it is shifted a little bit towards the right a little bit towards the red part every single one of these lines so we this is indication that the source that is emitting light is moving away from us and we call this kind of a spectrum a red shifted spectrum now if the source that is emitting this light is moving towards us then we will see all these lines produced by the atoms and ions in that galaxy shifting towards um, higher energies or bluer part of the spectrum so you can see here that the lines are all shifted from where they are supposed to be if the source was not moving so this these are examples of red shifts and blue shift the amount by which these lines will be shifted will depend on how fast or how slow the source is moving from us okay Okay, so I'm going to add some more detail to that picture. So I have marked now wavelength. If you don't know, angstrom is the unit of distance, okay, uh, or separation between uh, things. It's a unit of length. Okay, so maybe I should not say distance. It's a unit of length, angstrom. It's a very very small unit of length. Okay, so um, when you want to talk about small units of length, instead of right talking about it in meters or centimeters, usually in physics we use angstrom. So here I have marked the wavelength corresponding to these different dark lines in the spectrum. So here it is at three thousand, four thousand, five thousand, six thousand, and unshifted wavelength of lines in the spectrum. This is red uh, rest wavelength, and when they get red shifted, okay, that's the observed wavelength. so if you have a source that is emitting light and if it's moving away from us 
then we will see that the observed wavelength of these lines will be longer than the rest wavelength. Rest wavelength means if the source was not moving away from us or moving towards us, wherever the lines occur in that case, that's called the rest wavelength. And if the source is moving away from us, it's uh, the, the, the location where these lines occur is called the observed wavelength. Okay. So Hubble and Humaxon, they were recording the spectrum of these galaxies uh, and they found, they were looking at where the lines are occurring. Are the lines occurring at where they are supposed to be or are they red shifted? Is the observed wavelength shifted towards red or are they blue shifted? Is the meaning that whether the observed lines, the observed wavelength of these lines, is it shifted towards blue? Okay. Based on that, remember that if the line is shifted, it means that the source is either moving towards us or away from us, depending on whether it is blue shift or red shift. So based on that, they converted that uh, observed wavelength rest wavelength ratio into a velocity okay so that's given by this equation here if you are observing that the lines are at a specific wavelength which is different from the rest wavelength then that means that the source is moving with some velocity v so in this expression in the right hand side we see v and c C is the speed of light in vacuum, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. That is the speed with which light travels in vacuum. And V is the velocity with which the source that is emitting light is moving towards us or moving away from us. If the observed wavelength is not the same as rest wavelength, then we will have some value. If the observed wavelength is greater than rest wavelength, then this ratio is greater than 1 okay, and you will have a positive value for V. If observed wavelength is rest, less than rest wavelength, okay, then this ratio will be less than 1 and you will get a negative value for V. I, if you can write down this equation and later on play with it and see how this comes about. Now, in astronomy, uh, astronomers usually write the same expression in the following way, observed wavelength by rest wavelength is equal to 1 plus z, where this term z is called redshift. Now, the reason why I am right, I am showing you the second equation is because we are going to give you a small assignment at the end of this presentation, which you have to submit in maybe in a week's time or something. There, the expression 1 plus z is equal to square root of 1 plus v by c divided by 1 minus v by c is given. Okay. So, z is a parameter that is used in cosmology and it's called redshift. Okay? It's nothing but the ratio of observed wavelength to rest wavelength. And if you don't, if you have doubts about what this means, etc., in your group discussions with your mentors, with, your, with the volunteers, you can always discuss this. So, Hubble and Humanson observed the spectrum of galaxies and from that spectrum, they found out what the observed wavelength of lines are and what is the wavelength that those lines should have. And from that, they estimated the velocities of those galaxies relative to us. Okay. So that is one parameter that they found out. From the spectrum, they measured the velocities of galaxies in the nearby universe. Okay. Another parameter that they measured for the galaxy is the distance to those galaxies. They measured velocities from the spectrum and the second quantity that they measured is the distance to those galaxies. So in the next couple of slides, I will show you how they went about measuring distance. Now, if you want to measure the distance to objects that are very near to you, it's very easy. All you have to take is a ruler, a scale or a tape, a measuring tape, and you can easily measure it. Okay. Now, but suppose I ask you are standing in, a, in an open place and I ask you to measure the distance to a distant tree. Okay, then you need to get a really long tape or a string to do that. And it will take some time to measure the distance to a distant tree. Now, if I ask you to measure a distance to a very far away mountain, okay, it's going to be more difficult. Now, suppose I ask you to measure the distance to the moon. Okay, it's going to be really difficult. Okay. So here, uh, Hubble and Humanson had to measure distances to galaxies that are millions of light years away from us. 
as most of you know in astronomy we use this term called light year which is the distance that light travels in one year a light is the fastest object in the universe and traveling at a speed of about 300000 kilometers in one second uh, how much distance that does light cover in one year okay in one year there are about 31 million seconds so you can compute that and uh, so just to give you an idea in one second uh, a light particle a photon can go around the earth seven times okay so that's how fast light is traveling and the galaxies that we see in the local universe are several hundreds of thousand to maybe millions of uh, light years away from us so to measure distances to these galaxies is not easy so um, let's see how they went about measuring distances so again they had to use some laws of physics for that so to understand what those laws of physics are let's look at a very simple example let's take the case of a light source like a light bulb and suppose we measure the amount of light that we get at a certain distance from this light bulb say 1 unit of distance so this 1 unit could be 1 cm it could be 1 meter it could be 1 km it's up to you okay? some 1 unit of distance let's say we measure how much light we are getting on a surface let's say that the amount of light that we get from the source uh, at on a screen that is kept 1 unit of distance away suppose that value is x then if you now take uh the screen out to a distance that is twice that is okay, so a 2 units of distance so if this is 1 meter this would be 2 meters if this is 1 cm this would be 2 cm suppose you take it out to a distance of uh that's twice as large as this first one then the amount of light we get obviously it will be dimmer right the source will be dimmer because the far, the farther away you move from the source the dimmer and dimmer it appears so the amount of light that we get here will be 1/4 will be 25 percentage of this will be 1/4 of what you got here will be x by 4 now suppose you take the screen out to a distance that is three times the initial distance okay then it will be the amount of light that you will be you will be getting will be even smaller it will be 1/9 of what you got here so you can clearly see what is happening that the amount of light that we get from a source as we move further and further away from that source that the amount of light that we get decreases by 1 by square root of that distance sorry square of that distance not square root 1 by square of that distance right so if this is one unit then if this is x and it twi twice that it will be 1 by 2 square and if it is thrice that it will be 1 by 3 square which is 9 so this establishes a relationship between the observed brightness how much brightness do we observe for a source and its actual brightness and the distance that separates the place from where we measure the brightness and the actual brightness so that relationship is observed brightness is actual brightness divided by 4 pi d square where d is the distance that separates us from the source this is called the inverse square law of light and what it essentially means is farther away an object is fainter it will be so what this means is that if you know the actual brightness of an object and if you can measure how bright that object appears to us then using this relationship we can find out how far away that object is okay so sitting here on earth when we are looking at a distant galaxy we collect light and we measure what is its observed brightness now if we can find out what is its actual brightness then we can find out how far away that galaxy is so then the question is how do we go about finding actual brightness it is not easy so for that again uh, we have to go back to the uh, late 19th and early early 20th century the person whom you are looking at in this slide uh, is a very famous uh, astronomer again american astronomer her name is henrietta leavitt okay. she was working in a place called the harvard college observatory in the early 20th century late eight, late 19th and early 20th century 
And while working at Harvard College Observatory in Cambridge in the US, um, Henrietta Leavitt and some of her colleagues performed very meticulous analysis of a class of stars called Cepheids, C-E-P-H-E-I-D, Cepheids. Now these Cepheids are very interesting because mostly stars are, have a constant brightness. If you take the case of the sun, the sun has a very steady brightness. So do most of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But there are a class of stars called variable stars. And the, for, for these stars, their brightness changes with time in a periodic manner, which means that the brightness will increase and decrease. And then again, it will increase and decrease. So there is a periodic change in brightness for these stars. And such stars are called variable stars. And there are, there are a class of variable stars called Cepheids. Okay. And Henrietta Leavitt, she started observing these Cepheid stars, these variable stars. So in this picture, what you're looking at is uh, several images taken at different times, stitched together, combined together to make an animation. Every object that you see, every bulb, like small source of light that you're seeing is a star. And most of them, if you look at it, their brightness is not changing. Okay? So it's a time-lapse animation. Their brightness is not changing, but some of the objects, if you look at it, their brightnesses are changing. For example, if you can trace my mouse pointer, here is one such star, here is another one. Okay, so with the passage of time, you can see that the star is growing and fading in brightness as though somebody is turning the knob up and down. Okay, so there are many such. If you strain your eye and keep looking, so here is another one. So these are all examples of variable stars called Cepheids. So Henrietta Leavitt, she observed these stars and she developed the powerful tool for estimating the distances to these stars and the distances to galaxies to which these stars belong. Okay? And that uh, relationship is, is what is shown in this slide. Okay? So it's not very difficult to understand. It's very simple. So it's a, this is a graph. And along the y-axis is the actual brightness of these variable stars. So the stars have a varying brightness. So if you take the average of it, a, varying, a variable brightness star does not have one brightness. Its brightness is varying, but if you take the average of it, that is what is plotted in the vertical axis, y-axis. In the horizontal axis, we have it's written period of variability in days. So what it means is what is the duration of time it takes for the star to change its brightness? So it's growing in brightness, it is fading in brightness, it's growing in brightness and fading in brightness. So what is the time it takes for that? And all these dots that you're seeing here, these are all measurements of Cepheid stars in the Milky Way and in a nearby galaxy called LMC. And so Henrietta Leavitt, she observed these uh, stars, their variability, and she also measured their actual luminosity, their average true brightness, their true brightness of these stars. And she found out that there is a positive correlation. There is a positive relationship between the two. The longer is the duration of pulsation, the longer is the duration of this variability, intrinsically more brighter are those stars. So brighter stars, their brightness changes very slowly. Whereas fainter stars, their brightness uh, changes um, faster. Okay. So what this means is that if you are observing a distant galaxy, and in that galaxy, if you observe a Cepheid variable, if you can measure the duration uh, of uh, its light changed. Okay? So if you can measure how long it takes for the Cepheid variable to grow and fade in brightness, then from that period of variability, you can determine what is the true brightness of it using this relation. So suppose you're observing a distant galaxy and you find a Cepheid in it and you find that its brightness varies with a period of 30 days. Then you take this graph that Henrietta Leavitt made and you go to 30 and you go up to this line and you go horizontal, you get what is the true brightness of that star. So once you have the true brightness, we already have the observed brightness because from a telescope, we can observe what is the brightness of that star. We can estimate the distance to it, 4 pi d square using this relationship.
So Hubble and Humanson used this idea that Henrietta Leavitt discovered, that Henrietta Leavitt developed, to measure the distances to these galaxies. So they, they did two things. One is from the spectrum, they measured the velocity of these galaxies. And uh, from the by identifying Cepheids or variable stars in those galaxies, they estimated the distances to them. So they had the distance and the velocities of those galaxies. And what they found is that, suppose this is the Milky Way galaxy, what they found is every galaxy that they observed, almost all of them were found to have spectrum that exhibited a redshift. Now recall that redshift means the source is moving away from us. So what it meant was that every galaxy that they observed was moving away from the Milky Way. So uh, the, for each of these galaxies, they measured the velocity and they also measured how far away these galaxies are from the Milky Way. So they had these two quantities, velocity and distance. Okay? So they plotted the velocity of these galaxies relative to the Milky Way on the y-axis and the distances of these galaxies from the Milky Way along the horizontal axis. So they took the first galaxy, measured how uh, it, the redshift in its spectrum, which, tell, which, uh, which tells us how fast the galaxy is moving away. They also measured the distance and they plotted a data point. So this corresponds to one of the galaxies. It is at a certain distance from us. So here we are here. We are, it's at a certain distance from us and it's moving with a certain velocity. Another galaxy, which is a little bit farther away from us, they found that it's moving, it is also moving away from us, but this time with a slightly larger velocity. And then the third galaxy, fourth one, fifth one, okay. And then so they had about 22 galaxies in their sample. And so they measured the distance and velocity to each single one of them. And they found this trend. I'll just show you once again. So they found that the data points are scattered like this. So if you now stare at this plot, I'm sure many of you have made graphs like uh, scatter plots like this. If you stare at it, immediately you see that there is a trend. The trend is that, first of all, the galaxies are all receding away from us. So that trend is already we have mentioned. The second trend is that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it is receding from us. A galaxy that's close to us is also receding, but it's receding with a smaller velocity. So smaller velocity is towards the bottom of this y-axis, larger velocity is towards the top of this y-axis. So that's how you plot a graph, right? You plot smaller numbers here, bigger numbers there. So further away a galaxy is, faster it is moving away from us. So this kind of a trend is called a positive correlation, which means with increase in distance, velocity also increases. So with increase in the quantity that is plotted along one axis, if the quantity that is plotted along the other axis also increases, we call it a positive correlation. So this positive correlation is what Hubble and Humanson observed. And if all galaxies are moving, well, all the galaxies that they observed, if they're all moving away from the Milky Way, then that suggests that we are not living in a static universe. The universe that we are living in is not stationary, but it is expanding, okay? It's expanding, so things are moving away. And so here is the plot, sorry, here is the plot that Hubble and Humanson made. So here you have velocity, along the y-axis and distance along the x-axis. And notice that distance is written in a unit that may not be familiar to you. It's written as MPC, where M stands for million and PC stands for parsec. A parsec, one parsec is 3.26 light years. It's a distance, it's a unit that astronomers use to talk about large distances in the universe. So this means this is in terms of million parsec, sometimes also called mega parsec. So this is 0.5 million parsec, this is 1 million parsec, this is 1.5, this is 2 million parsec, which means that light from these galaxies is going to take 1 million years 
or 6 million years to reach us. That's how far away these galaxies are. And this is velocity in kilometers per second. So this is that plot with the scattered data points. And they fitted a line to formalize this relationship between radial velocity and distance. We are seeing a positive trend. Okay. We are seeing a positive trend. And to convert this trend into an equation, y is equal to something into x. Okay. You need to fit a regression line. So in the assignment that uh, I'm going to give, you will be making a plot like this, where I, I have given you data of galaxies. And you have to plot them with velocity along the y-axis and distance of these galaxies from us along the x-axis. And you will have to fit a line. Uh, this is called a best fit line. And notice that in order to draw a line, you need two points. You need at least two points to draw a line. But usually a best fit line is a line that doesn't, is, is not a line that passes through all the points. But instead, it's a line that represents the trend between the two quantities that are plotted along the x-axis and the y-axis. That's a best fit line. So they plotted this best fit line to this, which formalizes, which helps us to formalize this trend between radial velocity and distance. And they measured the slope of this line. Now, I don't know whether in uh, uh, high school you learn about slopes of lines. So just as a refresher, okay. If you have x-axis and y-axis, and if you draw a line in this graph paper like that, then we can measure a quantity called the slope of the line. Okay? And the slope of the line is nothing but the change in y-coordinate divided by the change in x-coordinate. So this point here has a coordinate x-y. This point here has another coordinate x-y. So going from here to here, both the x and the y coordinates change. And therefore, this line has a slope, okay, which is the change in y divided by change in x. Now, if this straight line, if this green line was parallel to x-axis, okay, if it was parallel to x-axis, then x coordinate is changing along the line, but y is not changing. So such a line does not have any slope. Similarly, if the line is parallel to y-axis, y coordinate is changing, but not x. So it doesn't have a slope. Only if it is like this, it has a slope. And the steeper the line is, the larger will be the slope. So now you compare it with the diagram that Hubble and Humanson drew, where you have radial velocity, velocity along the y-axis and distance. If you measure the slope of this line, that slope determines how fast these galaxies are receding away from us. And that slope is called the Hubble's constant. Okay. And so the slope of this velocity distance graph that they made back in the 1920s by measuring distances and velocities to galaxies in the nearby universe, that slope is called the Hubble's constant. And the value of that slope is 70 kilometer per second per megaparsec. So 70 is a number and it has a units. It has units like this, just like length, we have meter, time, we have seconds, etc. This quantity also has units. Now, since the y-axis is kilometer per second and x-axis is megaparsec, slope is y-axis divided by x-axis. The change in y divided by change in x. So the slope has dimensions of kilometer per second or units of kilometer per second, which is the y-axis, per megaparsec, which is x-axis. Okay. Now, if you look at it, megaparsec and kilometer are both dimensions of distance. So ideally, this cancels off, but usually this Hubble's constant is written like this, 70 kilometer per second per megaparsec. And the reason is because it's very useful to talk about the slope of this line in these terms. Okay, So what it means is that if you take a galaxy that is one megaparsec away, one million parsec away, remember parsec is 3.26 light years, so that's about uh, 3 million light years away. If you take a galaxy that's 3 million light years away, then that galaxy will be moving away from us with a speed of 70 kilometers per second. If you take a galaxy that is 2 million parsec away, okay, so that means it is 6 million light years away, then that galaxy will be moving away from us with a speed of twice this, that is 140 kilometers per second. 
If you take a galaxy that is 3 million parsec away, it will be moving with three times the speed. So that is 210 kilometers per second, so on and so forth. So therefore, we can write the expression as velocity with which galaxies are receding is equal to the slope of this line, which is Hubble's constant, into distances that separate us from that galaxy. So the, here is the first point, which I want to remember which I want you to remember, uh, most of the galaxies in the universe are receding away from the Milky Way. The farther away a galaxy is, the faster is its recession speed. Recession is the speed of speed. So faster is its recession speed means it's moving away from us with a large speed. If the galaxy is far away, then it's moving from us with a larger speed. If it's close by, then that speed is smaller. Okay. So this is the one of the first things that we learned from Hubble and Hermansen's observation. Firstly, that the universe is not static, but instead it's expanding. And these galaxies are all receding away from the Milky Way and the farther away the galaxy is, faster is its recession. So now comes an interesting question. Okay. Milky Way is we are sitting in the Milky Way. Milky Way We are inside the Milky Way galaxy. So sitting in the Milky Way galaxy, inside the Milky Way, we are observing these other galaxies and we find that all of them are moving away from us. So if all these galaxies are moving away from us, then does it mean that we are the center of this expansion? Therefore, does it mean that Namalani your expansion the center? But in other words, are we the center of the universe? If everything is moving away from us, then are we in a special place in this universe, you know, so that everything else is moving away from that? Now, the, only, the one way to answer this question is, if we go to another galaxy, sit there with our telescope and look at other galaxies, we can see what is happening. Okay? And then we go to the next galaxy. So if we can do that, then that'll be one way to answer this question of whether we are in a special place in the universe, whether we are in the center of this expansion. But as you know, it's not easy, it's impossible to travel to other galaxies. We cannot even travel to the nearby stars. So traveling to distant galaxies is out of question. So we are confined to the Milky Way galaxy. So based on uh, whatever we can observe sitting here on the Milky Way, we have to try and answer this question. So here is uh, where the genius of Hubble, Humanson and the astronomers of that time uh, come in. Okay, so what they said is that no matter which galaxy we live in, we will always see all the other galaxies moving away from us. So that what that means is sitting here in the Milky Way, we are observing galaxies to be moving away from us. Suppose we were sitting in some other galaxy. Suppose we are alien beings uh, living in some other galaxy. If we do the same observations, we will find that we are, uh, all the other galaxies are moving away from us. Suppose we are in some other galaxy in some other part of the universe and we do the same set of observations, we will find that all the other galaxies are moving away from us. So it doesn't matter where we are in this universe, we will always see that the universe is expanding. All the galaxies are moving away from each other. Now this is just an argument based on logical thinking. There is no way that Hubble or Humanson or anyone could have gone to another galaxy and made these observations. But their argument primarily came from the notion that there is no reason why we should occupy a special place in the universe. This is a mistake that we have made often, thinking that we are somehow in a special place in the universe. Initially, we thought that the Earth is the center of the universe. Then we realized that no, you know, we are just going around the sun. Later on, we realized that even the sun is not the center of the universe. Sun is just one ordinary average star in a galaxy of 200 billion stars uh, that we call the Milky Way. Then we thought maybe Milky Way is the center of the universe. And now we, are no, we know that uh, Milky Way is just one galaxy in a universe full of galaxies. So there is no reason why we should occupy a special place in the universe. So therefore, the argument was that no matter where we are in this universe, we'll see that the universe is expanding. Now, how do we, how can we understand that? To understand that, let's do a small experiment. Okay. I'll just start sharing my screen again. I'll stop sharing for a minute and I'll start sharing again. Yeah. 
I hope all of you can see the screen. So, yeah. So let's say that, uh, so I'm just trying to explain to you what it means when we say that no matter where we are in the universe, we will always see all other galaxies expanding. Okay, so let's uh, take four galaxies. We are just going to do a small uh, fun experiment. Let's take four galaxies. Okay, there's a green galaxy, a red one, a black and a blue one. And we are, uh, let's say that we are, uh, Milky Way is this green galaxy here. Now what Hubble and Humanson observed was that they found that all the other galaxies are moving away from us, which means we, if we are uh, sitting in this green galaxy and if you are observing this red galaxy, we find that the red galaxy is moving away from us. We find that this blue galaxy is moving away from us and this, this other galaxy is also moving away from us. So this is what Hubble and Humanson observed. But then they argued that if you are living in any of the other galaxies, you will observe the same thing. So for example, let's say we are living in this red galaxy. Okay. If you are living in that red galaxy and if you observe the nearby galaxies, we will find that the green galaxy is moving away, the blue is, so is the black. Okay. Now instead, if you are living in another galaxy, let's say this one over here, this one over here, we will again see that all the galaxies are moving away from us. Or if you are living in that galaxy, the one at the bottom, again we will see the same trend. I hope you are able to understand what I am trying to show here. So no matter which galaxy we live in, we always see the universe as uh, expanding. Okay, So this is an important finding. I will just share my screen again. So this is, uh, this is the idea number two, which I want you to remember. The universe does not have any center. The expansion is happening everywhere, okay? So the first point was that we are not living in a static universe. We are living in an expanding universe, okay? That was the first point. And uh, the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it will be moving away from us. And the third point is that the universe does not have any center. This expansion does not have any center. It is happening everywhere. Now, moving on to the next aspect about uh, expanding universe. So this discovery by Hubble and Humanson happened in the early 1900s. Uh, so 1927 is when Hubble and Humanson published these results. And they estimated a value for the Hubble's constant. The value that they estimated was 500 kilometer per second per megaparsec. Remember, I told you it is 70 kilometer per second per megaparsec. And the uh, 70 is the correct answer. In fact, Hubble and Humanson had made, uh, had not accounted for some uncertainties or some errors in their measurements. The, uh, their measurement of distances to galaxies was off by an order of magnitude, well, which means by a factor of 10. So that's why they got an incorrect value for the Hubble's constant. Their conclusion was right. They rightly concluded that we are living in an expanding universe, but the value that they estimated for the Hubble's constant was not correct. So in the, over the last 100 years, okay, or 90 or 100 years, astronomers have been trying to determine the value of the Hubble's constant as accurately as possible. Okay, so what, what I'm showing here, these are a list of famous observations that happened in the 1920s, in the 1950s, in the 1970s, then in 2001 using the Hubble Space Telescope, 2012 using a satellite called WMAP, 2018, uh, sorry, 2018, we are using a satellite uh, called Planck. Okay, so you can see that the measurement has changed and now we know that the value is somewhere close to 70 kilometer per second. Now, the, 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 don't confuse this with the, the changing of the Hubble constant itself. The Hubble constant itself is not evolving. It is the, uh, it's, it's that, just that our measurements are getting better and better, okay? So then the question is, why did astronomers spend nine decades, 90 years, trying to measure the Hubble's constant as accurately as possible? What is so special about it? I mean, you will not spend 90 years to, uh, to measure a parameter if it was not significant, right? So that, that means that the Hubble constant is something that's very, very important. 
So let's try to see what is the importance of it. Okay. So <clears throat> before we to explain what the importance of that Hubble's constant is, let's take a very simple example. Okay. Let's take the case of a, a race, a race between two cars. Okay. So let's say that there is a car race that's happening and uh, you have bought, bought tickets to see this car race. And so you're supposed to come to the venue where this car race is happening. But as usual, you know, we arrive at that venue late. Okay, so we are late arriving at that venue. And when we reach there, we find that the race has already started. So that means the cars are not in the starting line, but they are at some distance from the starting line. So we quickly look at the display board. Our display board on the our display board race the car the velocity and distance. So we quickly look at the display board and we find the, that the green car is moving with a speed of 40 kilometers per hour and the red car is moving at the speed of 20 kilometers per hour. So that's the speed of these cars when you look at the display board. And the display board also says that the green car, uh, the green car has uh, moved a distance of 40 kilometers from the starting point and the red car has moved a distance of 20 kilometers from the starting point. That's when we reach the venue. So now we look at the velocities of these cars and we look at how far away they are from the starting line. And suppose then I ask you this question, when did this race begin? We distance and velocity. We distance and velocity and divide the Time get them. Etra Same Medu, a car starting point in the Ipa Devadeano, our point Latanet. So forty kilometer per hour, Uri kilometer Uri Manikuri, Nalpa the kilometer a car cover, Nalpa the kilometer Uri Manikuri, Nala Vega de Lana, car Sanjirikina. So when did the race begin? Means so the race started one hour before. So suppose you reach the venue at ten AM, that means the race started at nine AM. The same answer you will get if you look at the other car. Okay, 20 km per hour speed, lana. so the car is 20 km from the starting point. So uh, this is, if you take the distance and divide it by the velocity, you will get one hour. So the race started one hour ago. Okay? Now, keeping this idea in mind, let's look at the Hubble distance velocity diagram. So we, this is that same figure that I showed earlier. Okay? So on the y-axis is velocities of galaxies and on the x-axis is how far away they are from us. Each blue dot that you see is a galaxy that is part of Hubble and Humanson's sample. For our sample, galaxy. For example, the iron kilometer per second is the same galaxy. We have two megaparsecs. Iron kilometer per second Vegadil Sanjari in the galaxy is at a distance of 2 million parsec from us. You look, take another galaxy which is at 500 kilometer per second. Other number in the one million parsec agalian. So, same situation as the cars, okay? Nalpa the kilometer Sanjari per hour Vegadil Sanjari, Nalpa the kilometer Zurath, Iruva the kilometer per hour Sanjari Chak are Iruva the kilometer Zurath, Raduvarathanian. Kudal Vegatil Sanjarik in the galaxy, Namal the Nuruva Dagaliana, Koranya Vegatil Sanjarik in the galaxy, Namukaditan. Okay. So now you have velocity on the y axis and distance along the x axis. If you take any of these distance and divide it by the velocity, we will know when this race started. So, if a race no the expansion, expansion of the universe. So, if, if currently, if all galaxies are moving away from each other, then if you rewind this back in time, okay, if you rewind this movie backwards in time, we will see that the galaxies come closer and closer to each other until they are all occupying the same region of space. If you rewind this current scenario. So that means we are actually trying to answer for how long this expansion was happening. Starting from the Big Bang. From the Big Bang, how long this universe has been expanding. So that is the that is what we get. In other words, we are going to estimate the age of the universe. Age of the universe is from the Big Bang 
ടു ദ പ്രസന്റ് മോമെന്റ് ബിഗ് ബാങ് തൊട്ട് ഇന്ന് വരെ എത്ര സമയമാണ് സമയമാണ് കടന്നു പോയത് എന്നുള്ളത് ഇറ്റ് ഡിപ്പെൻഡ്സ് ഓൺ ഹൗ ഫാർ എവേ ദീസ് ഗാലക്സീസ് ഹാവ് മൂവ് ഫ്രം ഈച്ച് അതർ സ്റ്റാർട്ടിംഗ് ഫ്രം എ കോമൺ പോയിന്റ് so uh, that's what hubble and humansen and others also did okay so they you can take any of these galaxies and take the corresponding distance if you they take the distance and divide it by the velocity you will get the time but since these uh, data points are scattered all over the place namaku or particular galaxy eduthittu adu measure eedal chalappa nammada measurement nattu korche uncertainties korche bias okke undaga adu kondu thanne ee best fit regression line ee best fit line ഈ സ്ലോപ്പ് ഉള്ള ഈ ലൈൻ ഇതിന്റെ സ്ലോപ്പ് സ്ലോപ്പ് ഓഫ് ദിസ് ലൈൻ വിച്ച് ഇസ് ദ ചേഞ്ച് ഇൻ വൈ ഡിവൈഡ് ബൈ ദ ചേഞ്ച് ഇൻ എക്സ് അത് ദാറ്റ് വിൽ ബി വെലോസിറ്റി ഡിവൈഡ് ബൈ ടൈം അതിന്റെ നമ്മൾ ഇൻവേഴ്സ് എടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ വി വിൽ ഗെറ്റ് ടൈം വാട്ട് വി നീഡ് ഇസ് ഡിസ്റ്റൻസ് ഡിവൈഡ് ബൈ വെലോസിറ്റി So, the slope is velocity divided by distance. So, velocity divided by distance in the inverse, we will get time. And that's called the Hubble time. And that gives us the age of the universe. So, if we have Hubble's constant, we will get time in the world. 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 That's why we will get time in the world. In the world, in the world, in the world, ഈ ഒരു റേറ്റ് ഓഫ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ഓഫ് ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് നമ്മളുടെ പ്രപഞ്ചം വികസിക്കുന്നതിന്റെ റേറ്റ് എത്രയാണെന്ന് മെഷർ ചെയ്യാൻ അസ്ട്രോണമേഴ്സ് ഒരുപാട് ശ്രമിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരുന്നത് സോ യു ടേക്ക് യു എസ്റ്റിമേറ്റ് ദ ഹബിൾ കോൺസ്റ്റന്റ് ആൻഡ് യു ടേക്ക് ഇൻവേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ഇറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് വിൽ ഗിവ് എസ് ദ ഏജ് ഓഫ് ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് സോ കറന്റ്ലി ദ വാല്യൂ ഇസ് സംവെയർ അറൌണ്ട് സെവന്റി കിലോമീറ്റർ പെർ സെക്കൻഡ് പെർ മെഗാ പെർ സെക് ഫോർ എച്ച് നോട്ട് യു ടേക്ക് വൺ ബൈ സെവന്റി കിലോമീറ്റർ പെർ സെക്കൻഡ് പെർ മെഗാ പെർ സെക് യു വിൽ ഗെറ്റ് ഫോർട്ടീൻ ബില്യൺ ഇയേഴ്സ് ഈ മെഗാ പാർസെക്കിനെ നമ്മൾ കിലോമീറ്റർ ആയിട്ട് കൺവേർട്ട് ചെയ്യണം എന്നാലേ ഇത് കൃത്യമായിട്ട് കിട്ടുകയുള്ളൂ സോ ഇൻവേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ദ ഹബിൾസ് കോൺസ്റ്റന്റ് ഗിവ്സ് എസ് ദ ഏജ് ഓഫ് ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ലാസ്റ്റ് ഫൈവ് മിനിറ്റ്സ് ഐ ജസ്റ്റ് വോണ്ട് ടു ടച്ച് അപ്പ് ഓൺ വൺ ഫൈനൽ ആസ്പെക്ട് അബൌട്ട് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ഹബിൾ ആൻഡ് ഹ്യൂമാൻസൺ ഒബ്സേർവ് ഓൺലി ദ ഗാലക്സീസ് ദാറ്റ് ആർ വെരി ക്ലോസ് ടു അസ് നോ സിൻസ് ദെൻ since the 1920s many uh, teams of astronomers have tried to reproduce this result by observing galaxies that are even further away hubble humansen kandadil ninnum vidurathayulla galaxies kodu include edond idhe similar result astronomers kandathan samichittunde appo anganathe or graph aanu idu nerathatha graph il ningal nokkiya ariyam y axis il 1000 km per second vare maatrame data points undayirunnullu ippo now we are all the way up to 25 30000 kilometers per second okay so the well uh, valara vegathilulla velocities vare nammal measure cheyittunde and distance also is correspondingly larger now this leads to an interesting dilemma okay so if you look at it these numbers are very large 25000 km per second il ennulla vegathil sanjarikkunna galaxies allengil 20000 km per second ennulla vegathil sanjarikkunna galaxies allengil 15000 km per second ennulla vegathil sanjarikkunna galaxies adhaayathu prakashathinte vegathayude aduthu ethunna speed il okke sanjarikkunna galaxies aanu nammal ee prapanjathil ullathana nammal kaanunnathu so this is a uh, this is not easy to understand because a galaxy is something that has a large amount of mass or a galaxy il egadesham 200 billion allekil 300 billion nakshatrangal undu valare bharam koodiya vasthukalana galaxies nu parayal so how can they how can these massive objects objects which have such a large amount of mass in the form of stars planets etc how can it move with this such large speeds ഒരു വസ്തുവിനെ വളരെ വലിയ സ്പീഡിലേക്ക് നമുക്ക് ആക്സലറേറ്റ് ചെയ്യണമെങ്കിൽ വി നീഡ് ടു ഗിവ് എ ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് എനർജി സപ്പോസ് യു ഹാവ് എ സ്കൂട്ടർ ഓർ എ ബൈക്ക് ഓർ എ കാർ ഫ്രം ഫ്രം റെസ്റ്റ് ഫ്രം സ്റ്റേഷനറി പൊസിഷൻ ഇഫ് യു വോണ്ട് ടു ആക്സലറേറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് ടു എ സ്പീഡ് ഓഫ് സിക്സ്റ്റി കിലോമീറ്റർ പെർ അവർ ഓർ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് കിലോമീറ്റർ പെർ അവർ വി നോ ദാറ്റ് വി നീഡ് ടു പ്രസ് ഓൺ ദി ആക്സലറേറ്റർ വി നീഡ് ടു ആക്സലറേറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് വി നീഡ് ടു ബേൺ എ ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് ഫ്യൂൽ സോ ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് എനർജി ഹാസ് ടു ബി ഗിവൺ റൈറ്റ് നൗ വി ആർ ടോക്കിംഗ് അബൌട്ട് സ്പീഡ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ആർ നോട്ട് kilometer per hour but kilometer per second and that also 20 25000 etc very large speeds so how can we understand these large speeds how did these galaxies acquire these large speeds or is it that these galaxies are really moving at these large speeds we train 
വേഗതയിൽ സഞ്ചരിക്കുന്ന ഗാലക്സികൾ നമുക്ക് എക്സ്പ്ലെയിൻ ചെയ്യാൻ വളരെ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടാണ് കാരണം അത് ആ സ്പീഡ്സിലേക്കൊക്കെ ഗാലക്സികൾ ആക്സലറേറ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുന്ന എനർജി ഒന്നും സോഴ്സ് ഒന്നും ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തിൽ ഇല്ല സോ ദേർ ഫോർ ദിസ് റെഡ് ഷിഫ്റ്റ് ഇൻ ദ സ്പെക്ട്രം ഓഫ് ദീസ് ഗാലക്സീസ് വിച്ച് ഇസ് വാട്ട് ലെഡ് അസ്ട്രോണമേഴ്സ് ടു ദ കൺക്ലൂഷൻ ദാറ്റ് വി ആർ ലിവിങ് ഇൻ എൻ എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ദിസ് ഇസ് അണ്ടർസ്റ്റുഡ് ഇൻ എ സ്ലൈറ്റ്ലി ഡിഫറെന്റ് വേ ഐ വോണ്ട് യു ടു പേ വെരി ക്ലോസ് അറ്റൻഷൻ ടു ദിസ് ഓക്കെ so what i have drawn here is the fabric of space nammada 3d space nammal jeevikunna ee prapancham nu parayunnathu oru 3d 3d geometry aanu adinullathu appo ee three dimensional space namukku 3d ee slide il varaikkan pattilla adond i am representing the representing 3d space use in two dimensions and so this grid that looks like a graph paper let's assume that this is the fabric of space this is the 3d space and in this space there are galaxies so let's say that these are two galaxies one of them is milky way and some one of them is some other galaxy that is at a distance from us now what uh, so let's say this is milky way and this is some other galaxy so what hubble and humanson and other astronomers observed is that if you record the spectrum of this galaxy we will find that it is getting red shifted and that red shift can be converted into velocity and suggesting that this galaxy is moving away from us so that red shift means that with time these two galaxies are moving away as i just showed in the this thing so i'll just show it once again there are two galaxies and these galaxies are moving through space and if they are actually moving through space then observation suggests that many of them are moving at speeds close to the speed of light which is impossible as i mentioned an alternate way of understanding the same thing is the galaxies are not moving through space but they are moving in space so there is a difference between that i'll say it once again the galaxies are not moving through space space iloda sanjarikkilla space inod oppam avaru sanjarikkana they are moving in space and what is really expanding what is really growing is space itself okay so ingane undayirunna or space grid with time it is the space itself is slowly growing and as a result the separation between galaxies is increasing with time but if you look at it nerthatha animation idil nammalude vyathasam nerthatha animation il ee grid ilude ee galaxies gal sanjarichu പക്ഷെ ഇപ്പൊ ഞാൻ ഈ കാണിച്ചതിൽ ഈ ഗാലക്സികളുടെ പൊസിഷൻ ഈ ഗ്രിഡിൽ അങ്ങനെ തന്നെ നിൽക്കുകയാണ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് ദ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് സ്പേസ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് സോ ദിസ് ഇസ് മോർ ഈസി ടു അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡ് ബിക്കോസ് ഇൻ ദിസ് കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് എ സെനാറിയോ ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് വിൽ ഹാവ് നോ സെന്റർ എവ്രിത്തിങ് ഇസ് മൂവിംഗ് അവേ ഫ്രം എവ്രിത്തിങ് എൽസ് ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് ബിക്കോസ് ദ ഫാബ്രിക് ഓഫ് സ്പേസ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് ഇസ് എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് now if this concept is not clear in the question and answer i will be happy to explain it more so a nerthai kaanichathu thanne oriki kuda naan idile kaanikkana so imagine that the 3d universe is like the surface of this balloon idu or balloon aanu appo adine surface adinath idu pole horizontal vertical lines undu nu vicharikka nammal globe ilaka varakkunna pole lines of constant latitude and lines of constant longitude adu pole ingane varichirikkana and there are galaxies ee kaanichirikkunna alla there are galaxies that are occupying different positions in this a uh, sphere now the red shift that we observe for these galaxies can be explained if the galaxies themselves are moving away from each other okay or it can be understood as the fabric of space itself expanding so samayam chellum thorum ee prapancham thanne ingane vigasichondirikkana the space is constantly being stretched thereby creating new space between objects okay and that stretching of space is what causes uh, the red shift that we see in the spectrum of these galaxies so in cosmology the red shift that we measure for galaxies is not a measure of the velocities of those galaxies relative to us but instead it is interpreted as the expansion of space itself അതിനു കാരണം വേറെ വേറെ ഒന്നും അല്ല നമ്മൾ അത് ആ ഒബ്ജക്റ്റിന്റെ വെലോസിറ്റി ആയിട്ട് നമ്മൾ ഇന്റർപ്രറ്റ് ചെയ്താല് വി എൻഡ് അപ്പ് വിത്ത് എ ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് ഡിഫിക്കൽട്ടി ഫോർ എക്സാമ്പിൾ ഇൻ ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് വി ഹാവ് ഗാലക്സീസ് ദാറ്റ് ആർ മൂവിംഗ് അറ്റ് സ്പീഡ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ആർ എയ്റ്റി പെർസെന്റേജ് ദ സ്പീഡ് ഓഫ് ലൈറ്റ് നയൻറ്റി പെർസെന്റേജ് ദ സ്പീഡ് ഓഫ് ലൈറ്റ് നയൻറ്റി ഫൈവ് പെർസെന്റ് ദ സ്പീഡ് ഓഫ് ലൈ
such massive objects like galaxies cannot have speeds that are approaching the speed of light or greater than the speed of light. So two objects passing by each other cannot have a relative velocity greater than the speed of light. The speed of light is a, a natural upper limit for uh, the velocities of objects in our universe. In a material aspect, velocity, relative velocity between two objects is only relevant for objects that are close to each other. Namalam Duri or galaxy and Namal reward a distance in the separation under. Other under the name Namaka, Iduri or la galaxy and the measure in the redshift in a Namaka in the velocity at Parayan Parana Shiria Villa. Paksha, we have to understand it as the expansion of space itself. So the redshift we measure is due to the expansion of space and not due to the galaxy receding from us. In this galaxy, we have to do the redshift in the velocity at the Parayam. So I think you don't have to bother about it now. Okay, and the last point which I want to mention is that, so this is all that I wanted to say about the expansion of the universe. Now, the important thing is for if the expansion of the universe is because of space expanding or space stretching, the fabric of space itself expanding, then an obvious question is why don't we feel this expansion? Space on expand in the Nondangil, near the presentation of Todakatal Namparna the Bole, Yanam Tangal and Namil and Namalipal Urumuri in the Samsari Kanan and Dangil, and why is it that we don't feel this expansion? Why is the space between you and me not increasing? Why is the distance between planets of the solar system not, in, not increasing? Arena and a four 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 thousand five hundred million years either. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, all the things that we do the We don't see the uh, planets moving away from each other. We only see these distant galaxies moving away. So when we say, said that, that, that moving away has to be understood as expansion of space. Planets in the space are not all Everywhere there is space. There is space between you and me. There is space between you and the next building. There is space between uh, Earth and Moon. There is space between planets. So if space is expanding, then why are the planets of the solar system, the space between them, not increasing? Why is the distance between stars in our galaxy not increasing? This is a common doubt that many have. So to understand that, we need to understand that there is always competition between forces in our universe. Okay, so the best uh, one easy example is, so let's say that you are standing on the surface of the earth, which is what we are all doing. We are all standing on the surface of the earth. We, this figure is not to scale. Okay, so Bhumi Itrem, Malit Balipur, Lundanagal, Manishin Itrem, Balipur, Undavila, but it's been just been exaggerated. So suppose uh, you are standing on the surface of the earth. Amakariyam, the reason why we don't fall off from the earth is because the earth's gravity is holding us to the surface. Now, gravity, uh, the force of gravity depends on how far away we are from the center of the earth. So now if you are, a, let's say, if you are a person with a certain height, the force that the feet, that your feet experiences will be greater than the force that your head experiences, the force of gravity, earth's pull of gravity that the feet experiences will be greater than the head than what the head experiences. That is because the feet, our feet is closer to the center of the earth than our head is. Of course, our height is very small compared to the size of the earth. But still, there is a difference in force between our feet and our head. So there is a difference in force. And if there is a difference in force, then that can cause stretching. Okay. There is a difference in force, which is what causes the rubber band to stretch. Or we hold one part of the rubber band where it is and we try to pull the other part. There is a difference in force, which is what causes the rubber band to stretch. Now, if there is a difference in force, then obviously uh, between our feet and our head, then why are we not getting stretched because of that force? Or why are we not feeling the tension of that difference in force? The reason is because we have differential force. molecules, atoms, they are all bound to each other through other forces. Chemical forces, chemical bonds, molecules. 
നമ്മുടെ ശരീരത്തിലെ മോളിക്യൂൾസും നമ്മുടെ ടിഷ്യൂലുള്ള മോളിക്യൂൾസും നമ്മുടെ സ്കിൻ സർഫസിലുള്ള മോളിക്യൂൾസ് തമ്മിൽ ദർ ആർ ഫോഴ്സസ് ദാറ്റ് ബൈൻഡ് ദീസ് തിങ്സ് ടുഗെദർ ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഫോഴ്സ് ഇസ് ഗ്രേറ്റർ ദാൻ ദ ഫോഴ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് ട്രൈൻ ടു സ്ട്രെച്ച് എസ് ദ ഡിഫറൻഷ്യൽ ഫോഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റി ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് ട്രൈൻ ടു സ്ട്രെച്ച് എസ് okay so therefore uh, the our the forces in our body the, the bonding forces in our body overpowers the differential force that exists between our feet and our head and therefore we don't get deformed ide nammal thanne suppose we go very close to a black hole okay and black hole has a very intense gravitational field earth bhumi apekshiche valare intense aitla gravitational field aanu black holes nallathu so if we go close to a black hole the differential force due to the attraction from the black hole between your feet and your head will be so large that you will be stretched nammal valinj ingena oru oru rubber band pole nammal valinj we will break apart into individual atoms or individual molecules okay so we will die essentially and that is because the intense gravitational field near a black hole can is sufficient to overpower the attraction between molecules in our body so that's why there is always a competition between forces okay so in the context of the expansion of the universe let's try to understand what this means okay so suppose now you are all standing for in an assembly like this nammal or assembly ning nikkana our school la la assembly okay vadinathu we are all separated from each other with a dis- with at a certain distance okay now a two of you which are who are standing close to each other there is a mutual gravitational force of attraction bharamulla ed rendu vasthukal kadayilum oru gravitational force und appo so you take any two people who are standing close to each other there is a force of attraction between them but still nammal assembly il nikkuva nammal mattaralade porthu poi vilugiyo nammal mattaralade eduthu idikku onum cheyunnilla unless we deliberately do it and the reason is because even though there is a force of attraction between all the people who are standing in this crowd that force is not sufficient to overpower the attraction of earth towards the center nammal ellam bhoomiya surface la aanu nikkunnathu so earth is holding us down towards the center earth is trying to pull us towards the center and uh, that pull is what keeps us stationary on the surface of the earth and that pull is more than the gravitational attraction between individual people people in this group which is why we don't get attracted towards each other appo bhoomiyil ninnu nammal oru vaadu agale poya vaanunnengile and if we stand like this slowly we will start coming towards each other because of our mutual gravitational force so there is always a competition between forces and so the reason why even though we are living in a universe where the space is expanding even though we are living in such a universe we, the reason why we don't uh, drift away from each other നമ്മൾ രണ്ട് നമ്മൾ പരസ്പരം അകന്നു പോകാതിരിക്കുന്നതിന് കാരണം ഈവൻ ദോ ദ സ്പേസ് ബിറ്റ്വീൻ അസ് ഇസ് ഡ്രിഫ്റ്റിംഗ് ഇസ് ബിക്കോസ് ദ ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷണൽ ഫോഴ്സ് ഓഫ് പുൾ ബിറ്റ്വീൻ അസ് ആൻഡ് ദ ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷണൽ ഫോഴ്സ് ഓഫ് പുൾ ദാറ്റ് വി ഫീൽ വിത്ത് റെസ്പെക്ട് ദി അർത്ത് ഇസ് ഹോൾഡിംഗ് അസ് ഇൻ അവർ പൊസിഷൻ ഇൻ അതർ വേർഡ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷണൽ ഫോഴ്സ് ഹാസ് ഓവർ പവേർഡ് ദി എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ഫോഴ്സ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് പുഷിംഗ് തിങ്സ് എപ്പാർട്ട് ദ സെയിം ഇസ് ട്രൂ ഫോർ ദ സോളാർ സിസ്റ്റം സൗരയുഗത്തിലെ ഗ്രഹങ്ങളും സൂര്യനും തമ്മിൽ എടുത്തു കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ദർ ഇസ് എ സ്ട്രോങ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷണൽ പുൾ ഫ്രം ദ സൺ ഓൺ ദീസ് ഇൻഡിവിജ്വൽ പ്ലാനറ്റ്സ് ആൻഡ് അറ്റ് ദ ലോക്കൽ ലെവൽ ദാറ്റ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷണൽ ഫോഴ്സ് ഇസ് ഇൻ കൺട്രോൾ ഓഫ് തിങ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് കീപ്സ് ദ പ്ലാനറ്റ്സ് ഇൻ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓർബിറ്റ് അറൌണ്ട് ദ സൺ ബട്ട് ഇഫ് ഇ ടേക്ക് ദീസ് പ്ലാനറ്റ്സ് വെരി ഫാർ അവേ ഫാർ അവേ ഫ്രം ദ സൺ ഫാർ അവേ ഫ്രം ഓൾ ദ സ്റ്റാർസ് ഫാർ അവേ ഫ്രം ദ മിൽക്കി വേ ഗാലക്സി ദെൻ ദേ വിൽ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ഡ്രിഫ്റ്റിംഗ് അലോങ് വിത്ത് ദ എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ഓഫ് ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് Similarly, if we take our own Milky Way galaxy, we have a Milky Way galaxy in the Milky Way galaxy. We have a Milky Way galaxy in the Milky Way galaxy. We have a Milky Way Andromeda galaxy in the Milky Way galaxy. This Milky Way Andromeda galaxy is the first attraction because of the Andromeda galaxy is coming towards us. It is not going away from us. So, if you just observe the Andromeda galaxy, we will not come to the conclusion that we are living in an expanding universe. That is because Andromeda is very close to us. milky way is very close to andromeda so they are both uh, bound by mutual gravity and they are not participating in hubble flow or this expansion of this universe hubble expansion kaaranam nundengil milky way il ninnu oru vaadu agale ulla galaxies namal observe cheyana which are not gravitationally bound to the milky way only then we will begin to see this expansion of the universe so i hope this is clear so i just want to summarize all the points so we are living in an expanding universe 
where the far away galaxies are receding from us at a faster rate. And for this expansion, there is no preferred direction. It's happening everywhere. It's happening right now in the space between us. The reason why we don't feel that expansion is because we are being kept in our positions by the larger force of gravity that the Earth is exerting on us. So there is no preferred direction. There is no preferred center for this expansion. The expansion is happening everywhere. The rate of expansion, which is what the slope of that line called the Hubble's constant gives us, is an estimate, gives us an estimate of the age of the universe. Now, the Hubble's constant which are in the inverse of the value, we'll get an estimate for the age of the universe. And most importantly, this expansion is not because galaxies are flying away from each other, but instead it is a space between galaxies that's uniformly growing. And that's the correct way to think about this expansion. So this is all I wanted to say, and I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Yes, sir. Rajivan, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Anand Narayanan. Uh, this was actually a wonderful lecture. Now, I would now request the students to present their questions. Either you can raise your hand or you can post your questions in the chat window. Uh, Rajivan, sir, we have, we have some questions in the YouTube also. Yeah, yeah, I'll take, I think I will start with those. By that time, I think they'll be able to, yeah, I think uh, Aditya Kishore has raised his hand. You can unmute and speak, Aditya Kishore. Yeah, sir. Yeah, Aditya, uh, sir. Uh, it takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to reach the earth. So it's actually you are seeing the sun that was existent eight minutes ago. In the same way, the distant galaxies are approximately millions of light years away from us. So the, light, the galaxies we see are the are the way they, they, they exist the way they were light, light, light years ago, right? So how do we prove that the expansion is still going on at this right at this moment now? Yeah, so the answer to that question, so first of all, that's a very important point. So just in case uh, the others uh, are not aware of this fact, the reason why we see objects is because the light from those objects are reaching us. Okay, That's how we see objects. So as Aditya was mentioning, light has a finite velocity. And in, uh, in everyday context, uh, we that velocity is so large that uh, everything appears instantaneous. Okay. Light is traveling very fast. But once we go, uh, once we talk about astronomical scales, uh, the distances that separate us from the, these objects is so large that light takes some time to reach us. So, we don't minute to minute. These galaxies are millions of light years away from us. So that means that when we are recording light from those distant galaxies, we are seeing how those galaxies were a million years ago. So Aditya, to answer your question, a million is still a small number when we consider it with, uh, uh, against the uh, age of the universe. Universe is 14 billion years old. So that is uh, a, a billion is a thousand times bigger than a million. So it's like um, saying that, you know, the, the current moment, the current instant that we are talking, how does it compare with how long we have been living uh, on earth? So if you are 20 years old or if you are 15 years old, you have been living on uh, for the last 15 years. And this current moment when this presentation is happening is only a small frame of time compared to that larger time scale for which you have been uh, living. So in the same way, for the com uh, considering the time scale for which the universe has been in existence, uh, distance to Andromeda galaxy or distance to some of the nearby galaxies, which are millions of light years away, is not really that great. But that doesn't mean that uh, the other fact is not correct, that when we are looking at it, we are looking at how they were millions of years ago. But in the time span of a million year, not much is going to happen to the expansion of the universe as such. It's a very slowly evolving process. So even though there is a difference in time from where we are observing and when the light uh, left those galaxies, it's not of much consequence here. But it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, Vrinda, 
you can unmute and speak brinda sk uh, hello sir enke oru moonu questions undu adile onnamde nu parayna sir last ayittu parnayirunnu adayathu andromeda yum nammal milky way kuda consider cheyanengil adu namukku endha adhigam expand cheyina pole thonnilla nu sir parnundirunnallo ee kadithekku varanu appo avade nammal observe cheya blue shift aayirikko adhe avade nammal andromeda yude spectrum nammal record cheyidale we will be seeing a blue shift Uh, that is because gra milky way and andromeda form a gravitationally bound system suryanum uh, planetsum pole thana or gravitationally bound structure aanu appo avade ulla movement avade ulla ee relative motion nu parayunnathu parasparam ulla guruthvaakarshanathinte prabhavathilulla chalanam aayirikku so there we will not see it so when we observe the spectrum of andromeda we will be seeing a blue shift sir appo next one idu to koru related aanu appo nammal ee andromeda milky way edutha pole അതേപോലെ നമുക്ക് ഒരു അടുത്തടുത്ത രണ്ട് ഗാലക്സീസ് അങ്ങനെ എടുത്ത് ഒരു ചെയിൻ പോലെ പോവാണെങ്കിൽ നമുക്ക് അങ്ങനെ ആ ഒരു ഐഡിയയിൽ തിങ്ക് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ നമുക്ക് ഇത് എക്സ്പാൻഡ് ചെയ്യുന്നു പറയാൻ പറ്റുമോ അടുത്തടുത്തുള്ളത് ഇങ്ങനെ വൃന്ദ അപ്പൊ ഇതിനകത്തൊരു എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാല് നമ്മള് വെൻ ടു ബി ബിഗിൻ ടു സി ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ എന്നുള്ളതാണ് അപ്പൊ നമ്മൾ നമ്മളിവിടെ മിൽക്കി വേയിൽ ഇരുന്നുകൊണ്ട് മിൽക്കി വേക്ക് വളരെ അടുത്തുള്ള ഗാലക്സികൾ മാത്രമാണ് ഒബ്സർവ് ചെയ്യുന്നതെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ വി വിൽ നെവർ കം ടു ദ കൺക്ലൂഷൻ ദാറ്റ് വി ആർ ലിവിംഗ് ഇൻ എൻ എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ഇൻഫാക്ട് ഹബിളും ഹ്യൂമാക്സനും ഒബ്സർവ് ചെയ്ത ആ ഇരുപത്തിരണ്ട് ഗാലക്സികളിൽ ചിലതൊക്കെ ബ്ലൂ ഷിഫ്റ്റ് ആണ് കാണിച്ചത് ആ ഒറിജിനൽ ഗ്രാഫ് എടുത്ത് നോക്കിക്കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ചിലതിനൊക്കെ നെഗറ്റീവ് വെലോസിറ്റി ആണ് നെഗറ്റീവ് വെലോസിറ്റി ബ്ലൂ ഷിഫ്റ്റ് ആണ് റെപ്രസെന്റ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് അപ്പോ നമ്മൾ അടുത്തുള്ള ഗാലക്സികൾ മാത്രം ഒബ്സർവ് ചെയ്യുകയാണെങ്കിൽ we will not come to the conclusion that we are living in expanding universe for that we need to observe far away galaxies so namakku ivudna where do valare viduvaradeyulla oru galaxy a consider kiya and that galaxy is so far away from us that we are not gravitationally bound to that galaxy angane aanengil because of the space between us and that galaxy stretching expanding we will see that that galaxy is receding away from us pakshe nammal ini aa galaxy illulla oru astronomer aanannu vicharikkya അവിടെ ഇരുന്നുകൊണ്ട് നമ്മൾ അതിനടുത്തുള്ള ഗാലക്സികൾ മാത്രമാണ് ഒബ്സർവ് ചെയ്യുന്നതെന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ വി വിൽ നെവർ കം ടു ദ കൺക്ലൂഷൻ ദാറ്റ് വി ആർ ലിവിംഗ് ഇൻ എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ആ ഗാലക്സിയിൽ ഇരുന്നുകൊണ്ട് നമ്മൾ മിൽക്കി വേയോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ മിൽക്കി വേക്കാളും അകലത്തിലുള്ള മറ്റ് ഗാലക്സികൾ ഒബ്സർവ് ചെയ്താൽ മാത്രമേ നമ്മൾ ഒരു ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷനലി ബൗണ്ട് സോറി ഒരു എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് യൂണിവേഴ്സിൽ ആണെന്നുള്ള തിരിച്ചറിവിൽ എത്തുള്ളൂ so you have to go sufficiently far away from the very nearby universe to perceive this expansion അതൊരു ട്രിക്കി ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒബ്സർവേഷൻ ആണ് അത്ര എന്ത് ഏത് ദൂരത്തിൽ എത്തുമ്പോഴാണ് നമുക്ക് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ നമ്മുടെ ഡേറ്റയിൽ ക്ലിയർ ആയിട്ട് കാണുക എന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ അത് കൃത്യമായിട്ട് പറയാൻ പറ്റില്ല ബട്ട് യു ഹാവ് ടു ഹാവ് എ സ്റ്റാറ്റിസ്റ്റിക്കലി സിഗ്നിഫിക്കൻറ്റ് സാമ്പിൾ ഓഫ് ഫാർ എവേ ഗാലക്സീസ് ടു ബി ഏബിൾ ടു മേക്ക് ദിസ് കം ടു ദിസ് കൺക്ലൂഷൻ സോ ഐ ഹോപ്പ് ഐം ക്ലിയർ പറഞ്ഞതിന്റെ ധ്വനി കിട്ടിയോ മനസ്സിലായി സംസാരിച്ചുകഴിഞ്ഞു <laughs> as time progresses space itself is getting added between objects idhina namakku onnigil space space in the fabric of space stretch cheyunnadayittu manasilaakkam allengil aa stretching inde bhagavayittu pudhiya space add cheyunnadayittu manasilaakkam so the no the, the, it was not that there is space existed before and we are ex- expanding into that space uh, expansion itself is creating space that's the correct way to understand this and above other than the big bang is that point uh, when both space and time started adagondani big bang in mumb endayirunno big bang in apporath endanannulla chodyangalukku prasakthi illathadine kaaranam big bang was not an event or an explosion that happened in space it was an explosion of space itself സ്പേസ് തന്നെ ഉണ്ടാ ഉണ്ടാകാൻ തുടങ്ങിയത് ആ ബിഗ് ബാങ്ക് തൊട്ടാണ് ടൈം തന്നെ ഉണ്ടാക്കാൻ തുടങ്ങിയത് ആ ബിഗ് ബാങ്ക് തൊട്ടാണ് ദർ ഫോർ ദാറ്റ് ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ഓഫ് വെദർ ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ഇസ് എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് ഇൻ ടു സംതിങ് ആർ നോട്ട് ദ ആൻസർ ഇസ് ദാറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഓക്കെ സോ സ്പേസ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് ഇസ് ബീങ് ക്രിയേറ്റഡ് താങ്ക് യു സർ ഗുഡ് ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ വൃന്ദ സോ അബിറാം ഹാസ് റൈസ്ഡ് ഹിസ് ഹാൻഡ് അബിറാം യു കാൻ 
ഹലോ സാർ ഈ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ഇതായിട്ട് റിലേറ്റ് ചെയ്താണോ എന്ന് അറിയില്ല എങ്കിലും ഞാൻ ചോദിക്കാണ് സാർ എർത്തിന്റെ ചില പഠനങ്ങളൊക്കെ പറയുന്നു എർത്തിന്റെ ഒരു പാരലൽ എർത്ത് ഉണ്ടെന്ന് പറയുന്നുണ്ട് അപ്പൊ സാർ അത് ഒരു പാരലൽ എർത്ത് അതേപോലുള്ള ചിലതൊക്കെ പറയുന്നുണ്ട് അത് ശരിയാണ് അപ്പോ ഇതിന്റെ ഐഡിയ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അതായത് പാരലൽ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ഉണ്ട് എന്നുള്ള ഐഡിയ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് ഇതൊരു ഹൈപ്പോത്തറ്റിക്കൽ ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു ഒരു ഐഡിയ ആണ് നോഷൻ ആണ് അപ്പൊ ഇതിന്റെ ഈ ഐഡി ഈ ഇത്തരം ആശയങ്ങളുടെ സോഴ്സ് എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് നമ്മുടെ ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് ആണ് ഇതിന്റെ ഒക്കെ സോഴ്സ് ഇപ്പൊ ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് വായിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടോ എന്ന് അറിയില്ല അഭിരാം വായിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടോ ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് എന്തെങ്കിലും അതായത് വളരെ സബ് അറ്റോമിക് ആയിട്ടുള്ള അതായത് ആറ്റവും അതിനേക്കാളും ചെറിയതായിട്ടുള്ള ഈ ലോകത്തെ കുറിച്ച് പഠിക്കുന്ന അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് വിവരിക്കാനായിട്ട് ഉപയോഗിക്കുന്ന ഒരു ഫിസിക്കൽ മാത്തമാറ്റിക്കൽ ഫ്രെയിം വർക്ക് ആണ് ഈ ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് വളരെ ചെറിയ മെഷറിലുള്ള നമ്മുടെ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തെ മനസ്സിലാക്കാനുള്ളത് ഈ ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് പറയുന്ന ഒരു ആശയം എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് നമ്മുടെ പ്രപഞ്ചം ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഡിറ്റർമിനിസ്റ്റിക് ബട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് പ്രോബബിളിസ്റ്റിക് അറ്റ് ദ സബ് അറ്റോമിക് ലെവൽ ഓക്കെ ആ സ്റ്റേറ്റ്മെന്റ് എന്താണെന്ന് ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞു തരാം അതായത് നമുക്ക് സാധാരണയായിട്ട് നമ്മുടെ ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തെ നമുക്ക് വ്യാഖ്യാനിക്കണം എന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ എക്സ്പ്ലെയിൻ ചെയ്യണം എന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തിലുള്ള വസ്തുക്കളുടെ കൃത്യമായിട്ടുള്ള ബി പ്രോപ്പർട്ടീസ് ഒക്കെ നമുക്ക് നേരത്തെ ആ കാറിന്റെ എക്സാമ്പിൾ അതിന്റെ വെലോസിറ്റി അതിന്റെ ഡിസ്റ്റൻസ് ഇതൊക്കെ നമുക്ക് അറിയാം എന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ വി ക്യാൻ predict many things about the universe so if you know the physical quantities that are relevant we can predict what the universe is like now quantum mechanics says that that will work when you are talking about the macroscopic universe noda valiya prapanchatha namma nagna netrangal kondu nammal kaanuna valiya prapanchatha no manasilaakan adu okay aanu so once you go into the microscopic level even if you know all, all the properties of the universe നമ്മുടെ ഫണ്ടമെന്റൽ മൈക്രോസ്കോപ്പിക് ലെവലിലുള്ള സിസ്റ്റത്തിന്റെ എല്ലാ പ്രോപ്പർട്ടിയും നമുക്ക് അറിയാമെങ്കിലും നമുക്ക് അതിന്റെ ബിഹേവിയർ എങ്ങനെയായിരിക്കും എന്നുള്ളത് കൃത്യമായിട്ട് പറയാൻ പറ്റില്ല ഒരു രീതിയിൽ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ മറ്റൊരു രീതിയിൽ ആ സിസ്റ്റം ബിഹേവ് ചെയ്യുന്നുള്ളത് ഒരു പ്രോബബിളിസ്റ്റിക് ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു എസ്റ്റിമേറ്റ് മാത്രമേ നമുക്ക് നടത്താൻ പറ്റുള്ളൂ കാലാവസ്ഥ പ്രവചനം ഒക്കെ പോലെ തന്നെ നമുക്ക് മഴ പെയ്യാനും പെയ്യാതിരിക്കാനും സാധ്യത ഉണ്ടെന്ന് പറയുന്നത് പോലെ അറ്റ് എ സബ് അറ്റോമിക് ലെവൽ വി ക്യാൻ ഓൺലി സേ ദാറ്റ് സംതിങ് വിൽ ഹാപ്പൻ ഓർ ഇറ്റ് മേ നോട്ട് ഹാപ്പൻ ഓക്കെ വി ക്യാൻ സേ ദാറ്റ് ദർ ഇസ് എ സിക്സ്റ്റി പെർസെന്റ് ചാൻസ് ദാറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് വിൽ ഹാപ്പൻ ആൻഡ് ദർ ഫോർട്ടി പെർസെന്റ് ചാൻസ് ദാറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് വിൽ നോട്ട് ഹാപ്പൻ അങ്ങനെ ഒരു പ്രോബബിളിസ്റ്റിക് ആയിട്ടുള്ള സ്റ്റേറ്റ്മെന്റ് പറയാൻ പറ്റുള്ളൂ അല്ലാതെ ഇത് തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ഇത്രയും സമയത്തിനുള്ളിൽ നടന്നിരിക്കും എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ഫേം ആയിട്ടുള്ള ഡിറ്റർമിനിസ്റ്റിക് ആയിട്ടുള്ള സ്റ്റേറ്റ്മെന്റ് നമുക്ക് പറയാൻ പറ്റില്ല ഇത് നമ്മുടെ അറിവില്ലായ്മ കൊണ്ട് സംഭവിക്കുന്നതല്ല പ്രകൃതി തന്നെ അതിന്റെ സബ് വളരെ സൂക്ഷ്മമായ ലെവലിൽ ഇങ്ങനെയാണ് ബിഹേവ് ചെയ്യുന്നതെന്നാണ് ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് പറയുന്നത് അല്ലാതെ നമുക്ക് സൂക്ഷ്മ തലത്തിലുള്ള ആ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തെ കൃത്യമായി മനസ്സിലാക്കാൻ കഴിയാത്തത് കൊണ്ടല്ല ദർ ഇസ് എൻ ഇൻഹറൻറ്റ് അൺസെർട്ടിനിറ്റി ഇൻ ദ വേ നേച്ചർ ബിഹേവ്സ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് സോ ദിസ് ഇസ് ദ എസൻസ് ഓഫ് ക്വാണ്ടം മെക്കാനിക്സ് അപ്പൊ ആ ഒരു ആശയത്ത് നമ്മൾ കുറച്ച് ഊതി പെരുപ്പിച്ചു കഴിഞ്ഞാലാണ് ഈ പാരലൽ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് എന്ന് പറയുന്ന കോൺസെപ്റ്റിലേക്കൊക്കെ വരുന്നത് അതായത് ഏതൊരു പ്രോസസ്സും നടക്കാനും നടക്കാതിരിക്കാനും ഉള്ള സാധ്യതയുണ്ട് വിച്ച് മീൻസ് അറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് പോയിന്റ് ഓക്കെ ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ക്യാൻ സ്പ്ലിറ്റ് ഇൻ ടു ടു വെയർ ഇൻ വൺ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ദാറ്റ് പ്രോസസ് ഹാപ്പൻസ് ഇൻ അനദർ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ദാറ്റ് പ്രോസസ് ഡസ് നോട്ട് ഹാപ്പൻ Okay. and then again in that universe that process happens the next process it can again happen or it may not happen so again there the universe bifurcates it splits into two angane ulla oru aashayathanaanu ee oru this uh, theoretical notion that there are parallel universes has come in observationally experimentally namukku ee prapanjathil angane oru parallel earth undo oru parallel universe undo multiverses undo അതായത് ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചം അല്ലാതെ വേറെ പ്രപഞ്ചങ്ങൾ പ്രപഞ്ചം ഉണ്ടോ എന്നുള്ളതിൽ നിന്നും യാതൊരു എവിഡൻസും ഇല്ല എന്നാണ് ഞാൻ മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നത് ഷോർട്ട് ആൻസർ ഫോർ യുവർ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ
സാർപ്പം സാർ പറഞ്ഞു യൂണിവേഴ്സ് എക്സ്പാൻഡ് ആയിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുകയാണ് ബിഗ് ബാങ്കിന് ശേഷമാണ് പക്ഷെ അങ്ങനെയാണെങ്കിൽ ഇത് ഒരു ബിഗ് ക്രഞ്ചിലോട് വന്ന് ഇത് അവസാനിക്കുമെന്ന് ഒരു സ്ഥലത്ത് വായിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ടായിരുന്നു സാർ അത് ശരിക്കും പോസിബിൾ ആണോ അതെ അപ്പോ ഇപ്പോ ആസ് ഓഫ് നൗ വി സി ദാറ്റ് യൂണിവേഴ്സ് എക്സ്പാൻഡിങ് ഈ എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ എപ്പോഴെങ്കിലും ഒരു ഒരു സ്റ്റോപ്പ് ചെയ്തിട്ട് പിന്നെ ഗാലക്സികളെല്ലാം വീണ്ടും അടുത്തോട്ട് കൂടി ചേരുമോ എന്നുള്ളത് തീരുമാനിക്കുന്നത് ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തിൽ എത്രത്തോളം ഗ്രാവിറ്റേറ്റിംഗ് മാറ്റർ ഉണ്ടെന്നുള്ളതാണ് അതായത് ഗുരുത്വാകർഷണ പ്രഭാവം ചെലുത്താൻ കഴിവുള്ള വസ്തുക്കൾ എത്ര ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തിലുണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളതിനനുസരിച്ചിരിക്കും അപ്പൊ അതിന് ഒരു 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 കോമൺ എക്സാമ്പിൾ പറഞ്ഞാൽ നമ്മളൊരു ഫുട്ബോൾ കിക്ക് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ അത് കുറെ ദൂരം ആകാശത്തോടെ സഞ്ചരിച്ചിട്ട് ഒരു സമയം എത്തുമ്പോൾ അത് സ്റ്റോപ്പ് ചെയ്യും ആൻഡ് ദെൻ ഇറ്റ് വിൽ സ്റ്റാർട്ട് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ഫോളോയിങ് ബാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് ബിക്കോസ് ഫ്രം ദ ടൈം വി കിക്ക് ദ ഫുട്ബോൾ ഫ്രം ദ ടൈം വി എക്സേർട്ട് ദാറ്റ് ഇമ്പൾസ് ഫോഴ്സ് ഓൺ ദ ഫുട്ബോൾ ദ ഫുട്ബോൾ സ്റ്റാർട്ട്സ് ഇറ്റ്സ് മൂവ്മെന്റ് ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് ദാറ്റ് ഇമ്പൾസ് ഫോഴ്സ് പക്ഷെ ആ ഓരോ ഇൻസ്റ്റന്റിൽ മറ്റേ എവ്രി ഇൻസ്റ്റന്റ് ദാറ്റ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ട്രാവലിംഗ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് ഗെറ്റിംഗ് പുൾഡ് ബൈ എർത്ത്സ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റി ആൻഡ് അൾട്ടിമേറ്റ്ലി എർത്ത്സ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റി വിൻസ് ഓവർ ദ സിമ്പിൾസ് ഫോഴ്സ് ആൻഡ് ദ ഫുട്ബോൾ ഫോൾസ് ബാക്ക് ടു ദ ഗ്രൗണ്ട് ഇതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഈ ഒരു എക്സ്പാൻഷന് ഒരു അവസാനം ഉണ്ടാകണമെങ്കിൽ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇത് ഒന്ന് സ്റ്റോപ്പ് ചെയ്യണം എന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ ദർ ഷുഡ് ബി ഇനഫ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റേറ്റിംഗ് മാറ്റർ ഇൻ ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ടു ഹോൾട്ട് ടു അറസ്റ്റ് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ അപ്പൊ അതാണ് കോസ്മോളജിയിൽ കുറെ വർഷമായിട്ട് കണ്ടുപിടിക്കാൻ ശ്രമിച്ചത് ഹൗ മച്ച് മാറ്റർ ഇസ് പ്രസന്റ് ഇൻ ദിസ് യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ആൻഡ് ഇസ് ദാറ്റ് എമൗണ്ട് ഓഫ് മാറ്റർ സഫീഷ്യന്റ് ടു ഹോൾട്ട് ഓർ ടു അറസ്റ്റ് ഓർ ടു സ്റ്റോപ്പ് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ആൻഡ് റിവേഴ്സ് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ബ്രിങ്ങിങ് ടുഗദർ ആ ഫുട്ബോൾ തിരിച്ച് ഭൂമിയിലേക്ക് വിടുന്ന പോലെ ടു റിവേഴ്സ് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ആൻഡ് ബ്രിങ് ഗാലക്സീസ് ക്ലോസ് ടുഗദർ ഇൻ ടു വാട്ട് യു ജസ്റ്റ് മെൻഷൻ ഡസ് എ ബിഗ് ക്രഞ്ച് അതിനുള്ള സാധ്യത ഉണ്ടോ ഇല്ലയോ എന്നുള്ളത് അപ്പൊ അതിന് വി ഹാവ് ടു മെഷർ ഹൗ മച്ച് മാറ്റർ ഇസ് പ്രസന്റ് ഇൻ ദ യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ആൻഡ് അത് വളരെ എളുപ്പമല്ല കാരണം നമ്മളൊരു ഒരു ഒരു പാത്രത്തിലോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഒരു മുറിയിലോ ഉള്ള മാറ്ററിന്റെ തോതല്ല ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തിലുള്ള മാറ്റർ എത്ര ഉണ്ടെന്നുള്ളതാണ് മെഷർ ചെയ്യാനായിട്ട് നമ്മൾ ശ്രമിക്കുന്നത് അപ്പൊ അതിന്റെ ഒരു ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ കറണ്ട് എസ്റ്റിമേറ്റ് ഷോ ദാറ്റ് ഇഫ് യു അക്കൗണ്ട് ഫോർ ഓർഡിനറി മാറ്റർ നമ്മുടെ പ്രോട്ടോൺ ന്യൂട്രോൺ തന്മാത്രകൾ കൊണ്ടുണ്ടാക്കിയ ഓർഡിനറി മാറ്റർ വിച്ച് ക്യാൻ എക്സേർട്ട് ഗ്രാവിറ്റേഷണൽ ഫോഴ്സ് ആൻഡ് അതർ മാറ്റർ അതും ഡാർക്ക് മാറ്റർ എന്ന് പറയുന്ന നമുക്ക് അത്ര പിടുത്തം ഇല്ലാത്ത ഒരു മാറ്റർ ഉണ്ട് അതും ഗ്രാവിറ്റി വഴി ആക്ട് ചെയ്യുന്നുണ്ടെന്നുള്ളതാണ് നമ്മൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കുന്നത് ഈ ഡാർക്ക് മാറ്ററും ഓർഡിനറി മാറ്ററും കൂടെ ആഡ് ചെയ്ത് കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ദർ ഇസ് നോട്ട് ഇനഫ് മെറ്റീരിയൽ ഇൻ ദിസ് യൂണിവേഴ്സ് ടു ഹോൾട്ട് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ നമ്മുടെ കണക്ക് അനുസരിച്ച് ഈ പ്രപഞ്ചത്തിൽ ആവശ്യത്തിനുള്ള ഗ്രാവിറ്റേറ്റിംഗ് മാറ്റർ ഇല്ല ടു അറസ്റ്റ് ആർ ടു ഹോൾഡ് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ ഇറ്റ് മീൻസ് ദാറ്റ് ദിസ് എക്സ്പാൻഷൻ വിൽ കണ്ടിന്യൂ ഫോർ എവർ അതാണ് ഇപ്പൊ നമ്മൾ കറന്റ്ലി നമ്മൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കിയിരിക്കുന്ന കോസ്മോളജിക്കൽ മോഡൽസ് പ്രിഡിക്ട് ചെയ്യുന്നത് Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, I think uh, we'll take up some questions from the YouTube also. Uh, uh, a question on YouTube. Uh, sir, the similar mutual gravitational attraction may exist between other galaxies like Milky Way and Andromeda. So, how it expands in a similar way or uh, in a faster rate, unlike those gravitational forces? Right. <laughs> അപ്പോൾ ഇതിനുള്ള ചോദ്യം ഞാൻ നേരത്തെ വൃന്ദ ചോദിച്ച ചോദ്യത്തിന് ഉത്തരവായിട്ട് പറഞ്ഞായിരുന്നു അതായത് നമ്മളിപ്പോൾ ഒരു ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞത് വളരെ അടുത്ത് നിൽക്കുന്ന വസ്തുക്കൾ തമ്മിലുള്ള ബിഹേവിയർ തമ്മിലുള്ള മൂവ്മെന്റ് എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അവ തമ്മിലുള്ള ഗുരുത്വാകർഷണത്തിന്റെ പ്രഭാവത്തിൽ തന്നെ ആയിരിക്കും അത് വിൽ ബി എൻറ്റയർലി അണ്ടർ ദ ഇൻഫ്ലുവൻസ് ഓഫ് ഈച്ച് അതേഴ്സ് ഗ്രാവിറ്റി സോ വി ഹാവ് ടു ലുക്ക് അറ്റ് വെരി ഡിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് ഗാലക്സീസ് ഓക്കെ ആൻഡ് ഇഫ് യു ലുക്ക് അറ്റ് വെരി ഇഫ് യു ആർ സിറ്റിംഗ് ഇൻ എ വെരി ഡിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് ഗാലക്സി യു ഹാവ് ടു ലുക്ക് അറ്റ് ഗാലക്സീസ് ദാറ്റ് ആർ ഈവൻ ഫർദർ അവേ ഫ്രം യു to uh, to conclude that we are living in an expanding universe adina best or example nu arayunathu nammal oru poyil
uh, attraction between these two boats. So the, the two boats are drifting away from each other along with the, uh, the, the movement of this lake, okay, or, or this river, sorry, not lake, but this river. So this is the same thing is happening. When we look at nearby galaxies to the Milky Way, like Andromeda or the large Magellanic Cloud or small Magellanic Cloud, they are all very close to the Milky Way. So they are all under the influence of their mutual gravity. So they are like the people in this one boat. You don't see them moving away from each other. But if you look at the people in the other boat, which is far away galaxies, you will find that they are moving away from us. So that's the crucial part of this entire thing. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, one more question from YouTube. Sir, if universe is expanding, the, sp uh, the space also be expanding, isn't it? Then what yes. is there, therefore, space is occupying that place? Yeah, so uh, again, I think this question also, uh, Vrinda herself asked, and I had answered this. So, uh, the, and in the presentation also, I mentioned that the correct way to understand this expansion is the expansion of space itself, is the stretching of space. There was nothing occupying space before that. space space matter radiation space space volume matter density matter photons there is no new particle that is added to this universe. It's only space that is being created. So if when space is being created without the addition of any new matter, that means that the mass is remaining constant and volume is increasing, which means density is coming down. So there's nothing new that is being created along with space. It's just space being created. Uh, thank you, sir. One more question from Krishna Prasad. Uh, sir, why is the farther gal galaxies receding faster rate at faster rate? Uh, is that because different parts of the universe is expanding at different rate? Okay, so again, here we have to take uh, the analogy of that car race. So, namala, a car race in the starting point. Okay. So that is the reason why far away galaxies are moving faster. The reason, the reason is because, because they were moving faster, they are far away. It's not because they are far away that they are moving faster. Now, uh, as long as we are doing this within the local universe, uh, we have to do this within the What we will be measuring will be the current, the present rate of expansion of the universe. Okay. So, I think that's my answer to the question. Uh, thank you, sir. I have a questions in the YouTube room. I have a few questions. I have a take up here. Saro, you have a question. I have a question. I have assignment. So I'll be sub I have already given the assignment to Breakthrough Science Society. If you have a question, you have an assignment. So I think one week is probably sufficient time for all of you to work. And you can take the help of your mentors, your the volunteers. They will also help you. And uh, what we can do is, on one of the future days, I can come online and I can explain how to complete that small short assignment. Basically, Hubble and Humansen and Chayda are their observation. What are important titles of cosmology? Are they observation on English reproduce another? I'm going to say another than a document lady to under. If you are facing a lot of challenges, I can come and explain on a later date how to do it. We will have again another session where we, I can take more questions. So I can take more questions then and I can I will also explain how to what the answers for that assignment mean. So Thank you, sir. That's why I have to take a look at the session. We have to take a look at the session. 
so thank you very much sir for this wonderful session now over to you uh, jodhis babu uh, uh, rajivin sir nan nan nammade vote of thanks ee session vote of thanks parayanayitte sri bale invite cheyana sri bale ps Uh, good morning all is it audible sir yeah yes. audible please yeah. okay sir so i am sri bala ps uh, one of the volunteers of the program the respected organizers of bss and our honorable guest of the session dr anand narayanan sir who enlightened us with a very interesting topic in the field of astronomy and cosmology so do not be a student of the institution i have already had a good experience a learning and working project experience with anand sir during my academic works attended several seminars uh, summer schools of him and sir is actually one of the best mentor i have right now and is a very supportive personality i hope there is no need for an exaggeration on his talks as you may have already witnessed his right now know your expanding universe was indeed a very beautiful journey from the history of our scientific temper on the cosmos to the present scenario where we are on the edge of discovering new evidences to prove how and why our universe is actually expanding and in addition the beauty of the gravitational force is was also really explained that we may fail to understand in our school classes and so on so it was really an engrossing lecture and there may be some units like astronomical measurements etc that you may not have learned before but so to explain that in a very simple way like the hubble constants and so on so i'm sure that the first and the foremost session of the camp was able to catch all your attention to the world of science especially for those who are really interested in the field of astronomy astrophysics and cosmology so though it seems like a very formal to extend a word of thanks sir on behalf of all the volunteers organizers and participants of a breakthrough science society i would like to extend my sincere gratitude to dr anand narayanan sir for being with us today in spite of your busy schedule thank you sir i also thank all the program organizers of bss for offering us with such an excellent platform for spreading science to the generation and now for all the coordinators for all the volunteers and our participants who took a great effort to join us with today we for we hope we hope for your effective participation throughout the session also thank you all thank you uh, thank, thank you sri bala thank you sri bala thank you anand anand sir namal inu pinidu thank you thank you very much sir